Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to revisit the case of the Queen and Falauka. Previously covered this video in terms of the offense of carrying a concealed weapon and what counts as concealed in Canadian law. However, the other part of this is the definition of weapon. And this case ultimately found that a firearm is always a weapon in Canadian criminal law. Let's have a look at that. So just to revisit the facts real briefly, Mr. Falauka was on the SkyTrain, which is sort of like a subway. It's located in Vancouver. He had a rifle with him, which was wrapped in his jacket because he didn't want to scare anybody. Unfortunately, people noticed it. They got scared. They notified a transit employee that he had this thing. And when he was asked about it, he then jo or he laughed and told them a joke saying, I'm just going on a killing spree. Nobody else found this to be funny. So later he gets arrested. The court did agree that he had made that comment, in, you know, as a joke. But again, not a great idea. This was a real dumb move on his part. Anyway, he was charged with a couple of offenses. The first was carrying a weapon for purpose dangerous to the public peace. And ultimately it was found that his purposes were not dangerous to the public peace. He was just going target shooting and then traveling. And then he was also charged with carrying a concealed weapon. So the court had to answer the concealment issue, which I covered in the previous video, but also the question of whether this firearm was a weapon in the circumstances. So let's have a look here at the, uh, at the law. And this is from the majority judgment at this point, majority being the people who, who won the issue. So they're the, this is the law. This is what was decided. So they're covering here the dissenting judgment from the court of appeal when they say dissenting judgment here. The dissenting judge would have allowed the appeal. He would have done so on the ground that a firearm only becomes a weapon if it is used or intended for use to cause death or injury or to threaten or intimidate. And the relevant sections of the criminal code, weapon means anything used or intended for use in causing death or injury to persons, whether designed for that purpose or not, or anything used or intended for use uh, for the purpose of threatening or intimidating any person, and without restricting the generality of the foregoing, includes any firearm as defined in section 84. And then uh, section 89 is everyone who carries a weapon concealed, unless he's the holder of a permit under which he may lawfully so carry it, A is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to time, or is guilty of an offense punishable on summary conviction. So the question they have is, is a firearm a weapon pursuant to section two? Uh, the appellant contends, as did the minority of the court of appeal, that a firearm is not a weapon as defined by section two, unless it is used or intended for use in causing death or bodily injury or for threatening or intimidating. I cannot accept that contention. A firearm was defined at the time in section 84 one as follows. Firearm means any barreled weapon from which any shot, bullet or other missile can be discharged and that is capable of causing serious bodily injury or death to a person and includes any frame or receiver of such a barreled weapon and anything that can be adapted for use as a firearm. Now let's take a break here and consider this just so that I can point out what the main problem is here. So the definition of firearm that we see specifies any barreled weapon and the definition of weapon specifies that it includes any firearm. So what we have here is a bit of a bootstrapping problem, because if we read the definition as it stands, it says in order to be a firearm, it has to be a barreled weapon. And then weapon says it includes any firearm. How do we get around that? And we'll see how the court does it. I'm not sure I agree with it. I really dislike this case. This is one of, if you ask me to rank sort of the worst decisions of the Supreme Court, this one might get the top spot. There's some other contenders, but this is a really bad decision on so many levels. So let's have a look here at the next paragraph. In my view, a firearm must come within the definition of a weapon. A firearm is expressly designed to kill or wound. It operates with deadly efficiency in carrying out the object of its design. You can see the sort of scary language here. It follows that such a deadly weapon can, of course, be used for the purposes of threatening and intimidating. Indeed, it is hard to imagine anything more intimidating or dangerous than a brandished firearm. A person waving a gun and calling hands up can be reasonably certain that the suggestion will be obeyed. 
A firearm is quite different from an object such as a carving knife or an ice pick, which will normally be used for legitimate purposes. A firearm, however, is always a weapon. No matter what the intention may be of the person carrying the gun, the firearm itself presents the ultimate threat of death to those in its presence. Here's the problem with that, is that the definition of weapon, when we see it, talks about in anything used or intended for use in causing death or injury to persons. But many firearms are not designed or intended for causing death or injury to persons. When we think about somebody with a 22 plinking rifle, that's probably not really designed for the purpose of going after people. It might be good at shooting game, you know, rabbits, grouse, that sort of thing. But I have a 22 single shot Kui. It's really not an ideal weapon in terms of a fight. Uh, you might actually choose the carving knife or an ice pick. Certainly if you were talking about close ranges, you'd be better off with a carving knife or an ice pick in a fight than with that single shot 22. There, If we start looking at things like an Olympic rifle, those are very much purpose designed for putting holes in paper. Many hunting rifles are very much purpose designed for shooting deer or moose or elk as opposed to humans. Now, there are some firearms that you might say this was absolutely designed for use on people. You know, if you're talking about an M60 machine gun, probably not a whole lot of, you know, debate on that one. It was designed for the purpose of shooting people. But we can also get into more unusual firearms. And this is where the logic really starts to get stretched. In Canadian law, a firearm essentially includes any barreled item that shoots a projectile which can put your eye out. Now this actually includes a large number of things that most people don't typically think of as firearms and I don't think the Supreme Court thought of when they came up with this decision. So for example, a paintball gun is quite capable of putting your eye out. If you're out on the field, they will absolutely tell you to wear your mask and there have been researchers who've seen, you know, how much damage can a paintball gun do to an eyeball? And I will tell you, it's essentially, it will completely destroy it. They Similarly, airsoft guns can damage or destroy an eyeball. We can go a little further. A nail gun. Many nail guns are firearms within the purpose of the criminal code. But to say that these things were expressly designed to kill or wound is a big stretch to me. To say that a nail gun operates with deadly efficiency in carrying out the object of its design in terms of killing or wounding. I don't know. I kind of don't think so. There's many nail guns, for instance, that you have to hold up against the surface and then tap the back with a hammer. This is not going to be an effective weapon in a fight. It's certainly hard to think of this as a weapon, except maybe that you might, in a, in a pinch, reach for it and hit somebody with it. But it looks like the court was only thinking of, you know, rifles and handguns and so forth when they came up with this decision. But unfortunately, it extends far beyond that. But again, even all, you know, even if we're just looking at sort of conventional firearms, uh, for instance, the people have made firearms which are uh, 22 gauge shotguns, which are designed and intended for shooting small pellets. These are pellets that are used for shooting birds, uh, typically inside of barns and so forth, where you don't want to cause any damage to the barn itself. Firing this at a person is not likely to be terribly effective. Was that designed for the purpose of killing or wounding persons? I don't think so. This seems to be either misunderstanding the range of things that they've decided should be included here, or more of a political statement. I have some problems with this decision. So they go on to say, the definition of weapon in section two must include a firearm as defined in section 84. For example, section 88 of the criminal code provides that anyone who, without lawful excuse, has a weapon in his possession while he's intent attending or on his way to attending a public meeting is guilty of an offense. The presence of a firearm at a public meeting would, in itself, present a threat and result in the intimidation of all who were present. 
it really cannot have been the intention of the framers of the legislation that people would be permitted to brazenly take their guns with them to public meetings, provided that they did not use them or intend to use them to cause injury or to threaten or intimidate. Indeed, to state the proposition reveals that a definition with such a result is unthinkable. Let's turn this around. If you go to a hockey game or other sporting event, there may be people there sending t-shirts and other prizes into the crowd by means of a pneumatic t-shirt cannon. Now, I haven't yet been able to get one of these things to test it, but I bet that you could use one of these things to put out an eye. And I bet especially that you could use one of these things to put out an eye if you used a specially designed projectile for that purpose. So if you took a t-shirt and fired it out of that thing, maybe that's not going to put anyone's eye out. But if you think at close range, if you took that same t-shirt and wrapped it around a hunting arrow, you know, and fired that at close range at somebody's eye, I will bet you large sums of money that that would be sufficient to put somebody's eye out. Similarly, if you put a t-shirt and then, you know, wadded up all sorts of, you know, use that as a wad and then had it firing out, you know, thumbtacks. I bet if you use that same t-shirt cannon as a thumbtack cannon, that it would put somebody's eye out without too much trouble. However, in its ordinary use, in terms of launching t-shirts, I don't think that we would be upset with the notion of somebody going to a, a protest and maybe firing some t-shirts into the crowd or using the same thing to launch confetti. That might seem to be just something people are doing and it might in fact be seen to be an essential expression of our freedom of speech. I want to distribute these shirts to people so that they you know, have them, part of that. Certainly I would suggest that the presence of a t-shirt cannon at a public meeting would not in and of itself present a threat and result in the intimidation of all who are present. I also don't think it can really have been the intention of the framers of the legislation to keep t-shirt cannons away from public meetings. So we get into a problem here is that the logic that they're using kind of counteracts itself. Now they next go to the French definition. Now Canada is a bilingual country. And what that means is that a lot of our laws, most of our laws are written in both French and English versions. And if you're saying, well, which one is valid? The answer is both. We can actually use the French language to interpret the English version and vice versa. So they note here, my interpretation of a weapon as including a firearm is reinforced when the French version of section two is read. It is in these terms, arme. Toute chose utilisée ou qu'un... I'm going to stop here because my French is probably fairly terrible. But uh, they note that this makes it crystal clear that a firearm is by definition a weapon. And they note, uh, so the language here is, le terme s'entend not, uh, notamment d'une arme de feu à sens de l'article. Uh, I'm forgetting my numbers because it's been forever since I've used any French. My apologies to the French speakers. I used to be fairly decent at it, but it takes about a week of speaking French to spin my brain back up to it. So I don't see that this actually gets us any, any better here. We still have the problem of unusual firearms, you know, nail guns, staple guns, t-shirt cannons, paintball guns, all of these things. And they say, lastly, I'm in complete agreement with the submission of the respondent that if the definition of weapons sought by the appellant were to be accepted, then the concluding words of the definition, which refer specifically to firearms as defined in Section 84 of the Criminal Code, would be completely redundant. See as well the reasons of the Ontario Court of Appeal in the Queen in Formosa, wherein the court also concludes that a firearm falls within the definition of a weapon set out in Section 2 of the Criminal Code. The problem that we have here, ultimately, is that what they're doing is avoiding making part of it redundant by making a different part redundant because the way they've decided this makes the term barreled weapon as it used in the firearm definition to be redundant and extraneous language we have to assume that parliament put that in there for no reason whatsoever and i don't think that this is necessarily the best way of resolving this inconsistency 
Now, I also want to look briefly at the dissenting opinion. And briefly, because this is the opinion that's not law. It was the views of a, another justice saying, this is how I would have decided the case, but he's outvoted at the Supreme Court. So this is the dissent of Lemur. It says, there are several reasons why I cannot agree that a firearm is always a weapon, irrespective of the intention of the person carrying it. First, I agree with Gibbs J's construction of section two that the foregoing generality referred to, in my opinion, is the word anything, and what the clause means is that anything, without restricting its ordinary meaning, includes a firearm as defined in section 84, and that it only becomes a weapon if used or intended for use to cause death or injury or to threaten or intimidate. This is fairly dense language. What he means here is that when it says that a weapon includes a firearm, that this was not intended to say that all firearms are weapons, but simply to say that any firearm that otherwise meets the definition of a weapon is not excluded from being a weapon simply because it's a firearm. So to set out that these are nesting categories, but that they're not, uh, but not to pull every firearm into the definition of weapon. They note, I also agree with Gibbs J.A. at paragraph 497 that an interpretation of section two, which finds that a firearm is a weapon, regardless of use or intended use by an accused, would produce an undesirable anomaly or inconsistency by way of two classes of person at risk under section 89. One class would be concealers of non-firearm objects, regardless of how lethal the objects may be, who will enjoy the benefit of paragraphs A and B in the weapon definition. The other would be concealers of firearms who would be denied that benefit with the result that for that class of persons, section 89 becomes in essence an absolute prohibition section. This is really important because this, to my mind, hits a major issue with this. So let us say, for example, that you are walking down the street and you are carrying a machete. Now machetes can be turned to use as a very effective weapon. But let's say you've just been to Home Depot, you've picked up this machete, you intend to use it to cut some tall grass that's in your backyard, prune some trees, that sort of thing. And because you realize that walking around town with a machete held in hand is probably going to attract some attention, you then take that machete and you tuck it into a bag so that nobody can see it. This is essentially what Mr. Falauka was doing with the rifle. Now, at this point, if you are stopped and arrested and charged with this, you can go into court and say, listen, the reason why I had this machete is I have all of these tall grasses. Here's, you know, here's a picture of my overgrown yard. This is what I was going to use the machete for. And the court may very well, assuming that they, assuming that they find you credible and that they don't dismiss your story for other reasons, they may say, okay, under the circumstances, that machete was not a weapon. And so the court would have to acquit on the charge of carrying a concealed weapon on that basis. Now think about somebody who buys a 22 in order to shoot gophers. They're in a very different situation. You know, notwithstanding that their intentions are the same, I have an item that I want to use for lawful, non-hurting people purposes, and I want to put it into a bag so that I don't terrify people, because if you're walking around sort of an urban environment with a rifle, people tend to get upset about that. But you're not entitled to that benefit because that firearm is now defined as a weapon. You might not have a whole lot of sympathy for the guy buying the 22. Let's take it a step further. Let's talk about a carpenter who has a nail gun and, you know, has a nail gun for ordinary carpenter purposes, you know, roofing for putting up framing. Just, he wants to put nails in things. That's all he wants. He's not going to be robbing a bank. He's not going to be killing anybody with this nail gun. All he wants is just put nails in wood. And because of the way our law works, and I'll cover this in more detail in a future video, that nail gun is a firearm. Now, if he puts that nail gun into his tool bag, knowing that when it's in his tool bag that people can't see it, because we've decided to define firearms as always being weapons, he's actually committing a criminal offense. So when the court is talking about how it becomes, in essence, an absolute prohibition section, 
That's what we're talking about here. When the police, as they regularly do, say, when you're going to an airsoft field, if you're an airsoft player, that you should put your airsoft guns away so that they can't be seen, they're actually recommending that people commit the offense of carrying a concealed weapon because there is no defense of, I was just trying not to scare people. Similarly, there's no defense of this airsoft gun wasn't intended as a weapon because this decision has decided and defined them as always being weapons. I'm going to read a bit more of the dissent here because in my view, it's the much better reasoned argument and almost every quote of it is just right on point. But this one I think is particularly good. Furthermore, I'm concerned that section two not be interpreted in a manner which could produce unjust results. I do not think that the morally blameless person who conceals a gun simply to keep it away from a curious child and not for the purpose of causing death or injury or to intimidate or threaten should be guilty of the criminal offense of concealing a weapon. I've just been talking about the morally blameless person, the carpenter who puts his nail gun into his tool bag to take it home is not somebody who I think is full of moral blame. It's not somebody who you know, who I think is a bad person. Ultimately, if that person were arrested and charged and convicted, I'd think that it was the court doing a wrong and not the carpenter. So that's a problem when the law is set up in ways that it can create those kinds of unjustifiable, in my view, results. Continuing on a little bit, uh, this court has stated on numerous occasions that where there are two possible interpretations of a statute, the one consistent with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is to be preferred. See the Queen and Nova Scotia Pharmaceutical Society, and they go through a few others. Uh, Given that a conviction under Section 89 of the Code would result in a deprivation of the life, liberty, or security of the person of the accused, the principles of fundamental justice must be respected. In uh, BC Motor Vehicle Act, this court found that whenever an offense is uh, created, the principles of fundamental justice require a minimum mental state. This was reiterated in the Queen and Vian Court, where I stated for the majority at paragraph 653, it may well be that as a general rule, the principles of fundamental justice require proof of a subjective mens rea with respect to the prohibited act in order to avoid punishing the morally innocent. In the BC Motor Vehicle Act case, this court found that the absolute or that absolute liability combined with the deprivation of life, liberty, or security of the person represented a prima facie violation of Section 7 of the Charter. He, so he's going on to this and saying, you know, you could go to jail for this. And so accordingly, we need to make sure that people like the carpenter are not potentially subject to jail sentences. Ultimately, this is a sort of line of thinking that the Supreme Court has not really upheld, that uh, offenses need to make sense, particularly where they are sending people to jail. But I think it's a persuasive one, and I wish that this line of thinking had been uh, more strongly advocated by our courts. Similarly, I find that the notion that laws should be interpreted in a fashion that is that narrows them where there's a criminal offense rather than broadens them, is one that tends to get thrown out the window whenever we're looking at firearm-related offenses. The courts don't much like guns. That's the uh, the bottom line on that one. So I agree with Gibbs uh, that the principles of fundamental justice enshrined in the Charter, combined with the logic of the language and the format of Section 2 of the Code, lead to the conclusion that a firearm can only be a weapon within the meaning of Section 2 and Section 89 if the possessor has used it, or intends to use it to cause death or injury to persons, or to threaten or intimidate any person. However, unlike a hammer or a brick, the essential purpose of a firearm is to kill and wound. Again, not all firearms. <laughs> it's. I don't think that anyone actually presented the nail gun issue to them. I don't think that this is something that they thought about. Uh, certainly, the purpose, when you think about it, the essential purpose of a paintball gun is that it's a thing you can shoot at your friends and not kill or wound them. It's really important The not killing or wounding is the fundamental, essential point of a paintball gun. That doesn't mean that they're perfectly safe. If you go out on the field with no eye protection, you could sustain serious injuries. But the whole point is that you can be shot with it and not die. 
That's that is the point. And yet it's captured by this. So it is inevitable, therefore, that the concealment of a firearm should create an inference unless contradicted that it is being carried as a weapon pursuant to Section 2. While the Crown has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt the necessary elements of the offense of concealing a weapon, it will be able to rely on this inference unless there is some evidence on the record raising a reasonable doubt as to why the firearm is being carried concealed. And this makes a lot of sense. What he's saying is that when you think about sort of ordinary firearms and the ordinary circumstances in where some, which somebody carries it concealed, many of these are for bad purposes. And so they're saying that as a starting point, the court should assume a bad purpose unless there's, you know, or assume that it's being carried as a weapon unless there's some evidence to the contrary. In this case, there was evidence which the court accepted that Mr. Falauka was not carrying it intending to harm people. But if you think about somebody who's, you know, walking around town with a handgun tucked in the back of their pants, they're probably carrying it with the, you know, the thought of harming people. Even if this is, you know, even if you think about them thinking of self-defense, they may not have anyone specific in mind. But the reason why they're carrying it is if somebody attacks me, I would like to be able to do, do harm to them. If it's called for under the circumstances. But that still makes it a weapon. But here you'd be able to rebut that presumption. You'd be able to bring evidence to say it's not intended as a weapon. And in some cases, the evidence that suggests that it's not intended to be a weapon would be obvious on its face. If we go back to the carpenter example, which I'm going to keep using, it, you know, the carpenter having a nail gun in his tool bag, that inference is rebutted basically just on the simple, you know, the simple facts being alleged. <laughs> it's a carpenter with a nail gun and a tool bag. That doesn't suggest weapon to me. Now, if you have that same carpenter taking that nail gun into a bank and, you know, pointing it threateningly at people and sliding over a note saying he wants money, now we're thinking weapon, not tool. So ultimately, this case is really frustrating because there's two really bad decisions in this. And all the way through this case, are these assumptions that seem to be unjustified or too narrow. They didn't expand their thinking enough to the general issues here that are created. I'm going to do a video in the future on the case of the Queen and Dunn, which talks about airsoft guns and paintball guns and similar, uh, those kinds of items, nail guns. And it essentially reaffirms some of the bad decisions that were made in Falauka. So I don't see Falauka getting overturned anytime soon, much as it should be. This is, as I've said, one of my least favorite decisions. I think it's absolutely awful and unjustifiable how the court was so narrow-minded. You know, I probably shouldn't use that strong of language, but it just, it's frustrating whenever you see this sort of thing. The assumptions that they make about, you know, gun cases that don't seem to be correct. The assumptions they make about guns when the definition of firearm is much broader. <sighs> well, I'll, I'll leave it off there. Thank you for watching. If you found this to be educational or interesting, please like the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see future videos. I want to thank uh, $50 Patreon supporters, George and D. Mo, uh, $30 Patreon supporter, Steve Browning, as well as all of my $10 Patreon supporters who are going to be following in the crawl below. I've been talking for a while. My throat's a little sore, so I don't want to go through it. Uh, I've got a link to my Patreon below. I'm also going to include a link to both my previous video on Falauka as well as the case itself. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.